recording is started. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for the invitation. And I'm sorry it didn't work in June because I was at the conference and we half of us got COVID. So, so what I want to talk about today are these cluster structures um, on Grassmannians. And I will not assume that you have seen cluster algebras or cluster categories, but I, I tried to explain the combinatorics a bit. Um, in my work, I'm interested a lot in how we can view or model modules for an algebra or cluster variables for a cluster category, cluster algebra using arcs in a, in a surface using combinatorial methods. And this one is very rich because we have links to other areas like the freeze patterns, which I will explain a bit, but also there are root combinatorics sitting behind, which I will probably not have time today. So I will start explaining with what I mean by the Grassmannian, and then I will talk about what these cluster categories are. And in the last part, talk about this application for freeze patterns. So, yeah. By the Grassmannian, I mean, I mean, I talk about the coordinate ring of the set of K dimensional subspaces of C to the N. We don't really need C, but in, in the algebra setting, it's going to be important that we have an algebraic closed field. So if we take some object in here, in there, that's going to be a k-dimensional vector space. So I can find some basis. Um, let's say V1 up to Vk. And then I can form the exterior product of these vectors. Now I'm going to be in wedge k to the, of c to the n. That depends on the choice of vectors like v1 up to vk, but it's independent up to multiplication by c star. So the basis choice is not very important. And and let me also say that I usually assume that K is at most N half. That's only important later when I say we have finitely many objects or cluster variables that depends on the difference between K and N. And so I can just restrict to K being at most N half. Okay, so this set of K dimensional subspaces of, of C to the N is, a, is an algebraic variety. And let's just have a little look at that. If I pick k indices from one up to n and I order them and then I can look at my w and express this w in terms of the elementary basis vectors so and in terms of elementary basis vectors of the wedge k I will have a coefficient for ex explicitly this set i. And if I let this run over all possible k subsets, so of this form, um, then I get a tuple or I get a point in Pn, large capital N, so it's not the same as the small n. And that gives me an embedding of the set of all k subspaces of c to the n into p to the n. And that's called the Plücker embedding. That's a classical. Um, object in algebraic geometry from a long time ago. So this is an injective map. The image is not all of P to the N, but there are relations satisfied by the image. And they are called the Plücker relations. So the image of phi satisfies these relations. Well, here we have to sum up over so we have these k subsets, and then we take another, I should write that. k plus one subset, which starts at zero. So it has one element more, wouldn't fit, but then I remove one of those elements and move them into the first term. So this is going to be not ordered in general. 
because the JR can be smaller than some of those, or it could be even one of those before. So we have to extend a little bit our wedge product definition, or we have to allow for repetition. But then that term is just going to vanish. And if we want to order the indices here, so if we switch two positions, because we have to change the sign. So that's because of the exterior algebra. Okay. And these Blücher relations tell you how the image of phi looks like. Okay. Um, but yeah, but I'm interested in the coordinate ring of this algebraic variety. And what Scott showed in 2006 is like, if you look at the coordinate ring of this, we should take the affine cone over it, <laughs> call that AKN. This has a cluster algebra structure by which we can mean that there exists a collection of these Blücher coordinates. So these are the PIs, um, which generate the whole ring or algebra. So we, we have a collection of a fixed size. This size is R, which is given in terms of K and N. Um, and these Blücher coordinates, they, well, the, the collection gives me a collection of Blücher coordinates. And I think of that as an initial information or datum. And then I also need a way to change those coordinates or variables is called mutation. And then I iteratedly mutate these initial variables. And in the end, I produce the whole ring. So this coordinate ring can be given by some discrete subset of size R and then iterated mutation of these variables of Blücher coordinates. And we call that a seed for this cluster algebra. But I'm not gonna explain cluster algebras at, in this talk. So the Q is the rule for mutation. Okay. But I'm interested more in the categorical side. So we have cluster algebras, which were introduced by Fumin and Silovinsky around 20 years ago. And these are commutative rings with a distinguished set of generators and then this mutation rule or an exchange rule to produce more and more variables, not just this distinguished set. Um, and generate this ring. On the other side, we have the cluster categories, first defined by Buan, Marsh, Reinecke, Reiten, and Todorov around 2005, and independently by Galdero, Chapoton, and Schiffler same time and then there later there are generalizations one that is important for today is by Clara Mio from around 2009. So we have these cluster algebras which often look like coordinate rings of algebraic varieties but we have categories of modules which correspond to them and this interplay has been very fruitful in the past 15 years because some results we find on that side, we can transport it back to understand cluster al algebras or cluster variables and vice versa. So, well, in these categories of modules, and I'm gonna explain a bit more what these look like, we have building blocks, which are the indecomposable objects. So it's not, just simple objects, indecomposable, we cannot write them as direct sums of smaller objects and they have to be rigid, which is a technical condition. And there will be usually a bijection between them and the cluster variables. And that's sometimes called um, cluster character map. 
we see C for Caldero Chapoton or for cluster character. In our setup today is always going to be the cluster variables um, arise first from Plücke coordinates and then they get more and more complicated. The indecomposable objects will have a counterpart. So there will be modules for the Plücke coordinates indexed by the K subsets. In the special case of the Grassmannian, cluster categories were given for it by Geis, Leclerc, and Schröer around 2009. And then later by Jensen, King, and Sue via Cohn Macaulay modules for some algebra. So this is sort of extending the Geis, Leclerc, Schröer picture. Geis, Leclerc, Schröer did it using some pre projective algebra and modules for it. <laughs> and Jensen, King, and Sue sort of completed that picture in a more symmetric um, category. And I'm going to use that approach here for today. So let me tell you what I mean by corresponding cluster category. We have a graph which we use to define an algebra. So my graph has um, n vertices. And then there are arrows between all neighbored vertices in both directions. And so a path algebra, what does that mean? I take a vector space from this graph with basis given by all paths. And I want it to be an algebra, so I have to add, um, have to give an operation and multiplication in this algebra is concatenation of paths. And this path can have length arbitrary. So let's look at the picture. My graph is rather complicated. Well, it has, um, arrows in both directions, it has lots of loops, so you can go around oriented cycles, which means, for example, if I start at vertex n minus one, I have a basis element for the trivial path where I don't go anywhere, but I have a basis element for going just using xn or xn x1, or I can go around infinitely. So this path algebra, is going to be an infinite dimensional algebra, which in general we try to avoid. And we make it a little bit simpler by imposing relations. So we want that at every vertex, when we first do an X and then a Y, should be the same as doing a Y and then an X. So that these relations at each of the vertices. So these are. and relations so that these short cycles commute. And then there's another type of relation which is important for the Grassmannian picture. So here we see the K appearing. Whenever I use K of the axis, I want that to lead to the same result as using N minus K of the Y's. So this is also N relations. So I'm not taking the entire big algebra, but I'm identifying some of the paths. It's still infinite dimensional because I can still go on forever. Yeah. So the problem with that is that a lot of the methods we have in algebra or module theory don't work for infinite dimensional algebras. And that's why it's difficult to work with these categories. And I'm gonna denote this algebra by B, K, N, or just B if I want to be brief. So if I look at the first relation, which tells me that this is the same as that everywhere, if I add up all these short paths, like just taking x1, y1, plus x2, y2, etc., that's going to commute with everything. And so one of the first properties is if you add up all these very short cycles, this is a central element, it commutes with everything. And I can define, well, T 
t to be that sum. And in fact, what we can prove is the center for this algebra. The algebra is not commutative, but the center is really given by t. So there's a polynomial ring in t. Well, it's the completed polynomial ring because also I should look, we take the completed path algebra, but that's for technical reasons is that we get nice decomposition into indecomposables later. <coughs> so properties of B, um, this is an infinite dimensional algebra, not commutative, but we have a nice center. And what Jensen, King and Su did, they took this center and looked only at modules which are free over the center. So any module for this algebra B, but it has to be free over the center. And I'm gonna draw an explicit picture of one of these modules. They're also called maximum cohen macaulay modules for this algebra. But I think the freeness is, is easier to see. So it means if I restrict just to acting with X and Y, I have to get a basis. But it means also that I can restrict at one of these vertices and I should just get a fixed number of copies of the center itself. I'm gonna draw that. Well, in two minutes. Um, yeah, so this is this category. It is a nice category, even though we're working over infinite dimensional algebras. It's a so-called Frobenius category. We have exact sequences. Um, we have projective objects and injective objects and enough of them. And we can get a cluster category from it. Really, we should look at only the non-projective injective part, but it's enough just to think about this for now, take all the modules. And what we shall in work with King and Marsh is that this category has nice cluster tilting objects, which was one of the ways to show that it's a cluster category. So we need, and that's an analog, to Scott's result. We can find a collection of K subset. So this word is I1 up to N I R. And the module for each of them take the direct sum and that gives me a cluster tilting object which is sort of that seed I had for the cluster algebra. Okay I'm not going to explain much more about this I will show how these modules look like but I can see how we get this collection is we we take a Posnikov diagram so this is a graph in a disk it's like in, in special cases you can just take a triangulation of a polygon and that gives you this collection. And R again was K minus one, N minus K minus one plus N. And so what Jens and King and Sue showed that the Pluca coordinates, which were the important ingredients in the cluster algebra setting, they correspond exactly to this nice modules MI. Well, these are the building blocks or like the smallest, let me call them the smallest. Modules in this category. Um, because we want these modules to be free over the center, it means at every vertex of my quiver gamma, I should have a copy of the center. So I have this polynomial ring at every vertex and the smallest possible number is just to have it once at every vertex. And that's what I'm gonna illustrate now. So 
So the smallest possible ones have just one copy of center at each vertex in the quiver gamma. Okay. So the way I think of this is I look at gamma and gamma would here be the vertices on the top, these six vertices. I take six and is six. And that every vertex, so I is six, I is one, I is two. And I should have a copy of the center and I drew the center here. Now the center was given by these small commuting cycles, X, Y. So really when I start with, we're working over the complex numbers. So we have one, we multiply by X, Y, that we get T and then we get T squared, T cubed, etc. So that was my center, the polynomial ring in T. And at every vertex, I want to have a copy of the center. So I have these copies of the polynomial ring and I have to say how they link up together, how they are joined. <clears throat> and for that, I should look at my K subset. So in the example, K is three and I take two ele three elements from one up to six. And then I have to basically say how the X's and the Y's of my quiver gamma act on this picture. So I want that when Xi comes from an element in the set, like X2 or X4 or X6, I'm just sending, let me copy that. I'm just sending one to one, T to T. So that would be with an X I for I in, in my set. And if I is in the set, I want that X, that the Y multiplies by T. So the Y goes one down. So here the Y is multiplication by T. And when X I is considered for I not in two, four, six, that's gonna be multiple. So then it's the other way around. So of, after all, when, when I look at X two, it should keep me in the top level and that's okay. But if I look at the Y in the same column, it sends me down one level multiplication by T. And so this whole picture sort of visual is a visualization of that module for my algebra B. Now I only satisfied the requirement that X, Y is Y, X, but we also had the other re relation, which was um, X to the three is Y to the three here. Well, let's look at one of these vertices. If I do one, two, three X's, and you, you so should glue this together. So this is all sitting on a cylinder. Um, I'm also here, if I do one of three of the Y's, I also land here. So the first relation tells me that all these little paths commute. And so we, we end up in the same place. And the second relation tells me that doing three of the X's is the same as three of the Y's. <coughs> Sorry. So this visual is a visualization of my module MI and is always gonna sit on a cylinder and we have one copy of the center in each column and it's infinite. So that would be a module or representation. for B or for the Kriever. Basically, I have to tell you what happens at each of the vertex, vertices of the Kriever and how the X's and the Y's act, okay? And these are the 
prototypes of the modules because one can show that any other module is built up using those. These are the smallest ones and you can just um, extend them and they get a filtration of any big module using the MRS. And that's one of the advantages on the cluster category side because you know every object, the indecomposable object is exactly um, extended from these, whereas on the cluster algebra side, it's not so easy to see more cl complicated cluster variables. Okay. Well, these are nice modules, but in general, they don't explain the whole category. So when K is two, all modules look like that. So all the indecomposable modules are of this form and any other module is just a direct sum of these. And we say this is a dunking type AN. When K is three, we still have some nice cases. Um, and is six, seven, or eight. Well, we have all these MIs, but you can count how many of those because you have to count how many three subsets of six you have or three subsets of seven. And then there are some new modules which are built by extending two of the rank one modules, or you also have rank three modules. So these situations are well understood and Jensen, King and Sue really explicitly described the whole setup and associated dunking type root systems to them. But in all other cases, so all other KN, we have infinitely many indecomposable objects. So we cannot always understand the whole category. Um, and also they will be of arbitrary rank. And it's a bit like if you look at the Katsumudi root system, you have um, imaginary roots and you can have roots of higher and higher degree. So arbitrary rank will appear, but still we can say some things in the arbitrary cases. So the next two bigger categories are 439 and 48. In, in these two cases, we sort of understand the whole Grossmannian cluster category. It's called TAME. That means indecomposables come in one parameter families and only few of them come in three one parameter families. It's like when you have one Jordan block in a matrix and that the parameter would be the lambda on the diagonal. <coughs> so we only have few one parameter families and we can describe the whole category in some sense. And then all others are called wild, which means we don't expect the full classification or characterization in general, that's too hard. But these categories are still nice. So what we were able to show recently, um, the modules still fit together nicely in so-called tubes. So I'm not, I mean, so if we have infinite many indecomposables, then this AR quiver, this describes, how uh, indecomposable modules fit together like, or build up the category. I should not say. Um, this is a quiver which has a, a vertex for every indecomposable module and it has an arrow for any irreducible homomorphism between them. And in, in normal wild categories, this is just far off. Um, but here we can show that these indecomposables sit nicely in tubes. So they almost look like these modules which I, I drew above. Um, 
Yeah, but then the first family of modules to look at are the rank two modules. And here we can say many more things. Um, so when M is in decomposable of rank two, I, I did say in passing, we can extend modules. So we sort of have a filtration. There's a rank one module, a quotient, and, and, and I'm sorry, that's the submodule, and MI would be the quotient. We can say exactly when that works. So we have to look at the two K subsets and they have to form three boxes, which means if we go back to my module, you see here, basically the top part tells me what my module looks like. And the top part for two, four, six, shows x2, x4, and x6 in the rim. And so if we keep that in mind, so we had we would have say mi, which is some rim. And then we have mj, some other rim. And what they have to do they have to form exactly three rectangular boxes. So when they're in parallel, nothing really happens, but we have to have three rectangular boxes. And when there are more boxes or when they are not rectangular, we know it's not a nice rigid indecomposable module. So conjecturally, this is an if and only if, but we haven't. got all ingredients yet. So the statement would be, such a module is rigid and decomposable if and only we have the three boxes. Right now we know if it's rigid and decomposable, it has to have three boxes. Okay. <coughs> so that's this part with the module categories. What we also show is that in all these cases, we get a nice root for our root system, which I've put on put under the rug right now. Um, but it means in the rank two situation, everything works nicely. Then I want to change topics a little bit by looking at an application to freeze patterns. So freeze patterns were introduced in the 70s by Coxeter first and then Conway and Coxeter. There are some very nice papers, the two papers by Conway Coxeter from 73. Um, they, the first one puts like a number of questions, around 20 problems, and then the reader should solve them. And the second one gives hints. And by solving them, you show the main theorem of this paper. So it is quite nice. <coughs> what is a freeze pattern? So a freeze pattern is an arrangement of entries in integers or in an integral domain. Well, what we want is that, so you could take a field if you want. Um, you want to be sure that when you multiply two non-zero things, the result is still non-zero. So for that, we need integral domain. This is arranged in a, in a grid with rows which are infinite to the left and to the right. And we start with K minus one rows of zeros. So here I only did two. Then we have one row of ones. And then we end in the same way. And K minus one row of zeros. And in between, we have entries, say in the positive integers or in an integral domain.
but then we want non-zero elements. So this is W non-trivial rows. So that would be the arrangement. And to call that a freeze pattern, we have a, a determinant rule. And what the requirement is, whenever you take such a diamond of size K in the pattern, its determinant should be one. So you, you rotate it around by whatever, 90 degrees, and look at that determinant. So really we're looking from here. Um, well, then you understand why we have the K minus one rows of ones, because the first one will just have zeros and sort of zeros, zeros above the diagonal and ones on the diagonal, and then the determinant is trivially one. And the same in the lower part. And I should say, Conway and Coxeter looked at the K equals two case. And then Roselle. And I think it was also in the 70s that, 70s that K arbitrary was considered by Roselle. Um, yeah, so Coxeter played around with these patterns for K equals two, and then these small matrices are just two by two matrices, and you want, sorry, that's not A, C, B, D, A, C minus, minus B, T equals one. Well, what Conway and Coxeter showed were many things, but one of them in these two nice papers is that such freeze patterns or the integers are in bijections with triangulations of polygons. And they'll show um, in a few minutes how that works. But also, like if we look at the k equals two case, so we have this row of ones, then we have a row of some, say, numbers in, in the integers or in an integral domain, and is when we know this row, we already know the rest because the next one is just given simply by this determinantal rule. So D would be a C minus one over B, etc. So the first non-trivial row determines the whole pattern when K equals two. And Cox had to call that the quiddity row, and quiddity means essence. And the way to show this by traction is to show how you get such a quiddity sequence or quiddity row from a triangulation of a polygon. Um, what they also show, and also Roselle in the general case, is when you take a tame such freeze, it's always periodic. So that wasn't part of the assumption. We only assumed we have a finite number of rows and we have the determinant con condition. Should say what tame means is any SLK plus one determinant is zero. So when you enlarge it a little bit, it, it has to vanish. Um, so every such freeze pattern is periodic when we assume tameness and the horizontal period is equal to W plus K plus one or a divisor of it. So at least you have this period of N, it could be also a smaller one. And such SLK freeze pattern have been studied by Bergen Reutenauer and Maurice Genou of Sienko Tabachnikov in the last 10 years. Um, 
And now let's look at the polygon case or SL2 freeze pattern. <coughs> so here, if we have with W, so we have W non-trivial rows, and then N is W plus three, that's the periodicity. And we're looking into triangulations of convex polygons with N vertices. So the freeze is given by the quiddity sequence. It, it has to have n entries for n equals w plus three. And how you get such um, quiddity sequences by looking at the triangulation and then counting how many vertices, how many triangles you see. So for A1, I see four triangles where you count the matching numbers. A2 has only one. And A3 has, let's see, close this up. Three again. Um, and A4 is one again, and then we have another three. And then two. And A7 is one. So this triangulation would give me the quiddity sequence four, one, three, one, three, two, one. And then you can start computing the freeze pattern. So, N was seven, W would be four. We expect four non-trivial rows. And the rules tells me that four times one should be one more than one times something. So we get a three here, a two, a two, a two, five, and a one. And then you can continue doing that. And you should see that, first of all, we always get integers. That's not obvious for a general sequence. Um, we never get zeros until we have another row of ones and we finish after four rows. So I'm not going to fill out everything. But for example, you have two times two here is four. It should be one more than this product. So we get another one here and another three here, etc. Okay, so that's essentially the proof, or that's how you can see that um, SL2 freezes correspond to triangulation of convex polygons. And the first row is given by these matching numbers. Or you can also compute the second row in terms of matching numbers, but then you have to look at matchings for two successive vertices. So this geometric interpretation with matching numbers then is has been extended by Proline. Crow and Isaacs in the eighties. Okay, so then within a few years after the definition of these freeze patterns, interest um, like died out because all the results were sort of found. You found this correspondence to convex polygon triangulation, you, you find a correspondence in each row. Um, but when Caldero, Chapoteau and Schiffler realized these cluster algebras also give us freeze patterns, the interest in freeze patterns has been restarted in, in like 2006 or seven. And since then, a lot of work has been done. And one of the open question was, like if you see this line, we have SL2 freeze patterns that correspond to triangulated polygons. Well, the question is, what if we take SLK freeze patterns? Is there a combinatorial approach to them? Can we find a geometric object? And I believe we cannot, but 
it's or at least it's not been found so far, but we find that we can use the Grassmannians to get to SLK freeze patterns. And that's what I want to explain now. So these Grassmannian cluster categories, they correspond to the Grassmannian cluster algebras. By the work of Jensen, King and Sue. And here we have Lucas coordinates in particular. And what we did is we formed a freeze pattern using these variables. So the sort called Lucas freeze of Lucas coordinates. And I should say, well, this is an integral domain. This is important because we're multiplying variables. We don't want to get zeros from non-zero element. Um, we take Blücher coordinates, arrange them in a freeze pattern, and then we specialize a little bit um, if we look at the eyes, which are successive, like a full interval. We want to specialize all of them to one. Well, in fact, I should say this is already done before. But then we specialize again. The cluster we specialize to one, and this gives me then integers. But I'm going to explain this on the example and in the theorem. So what we were able to show is if we take Blücher coordinates pi, and I'm just writing the interval or the unit of intervals for the Blücher coordinate in the following way. So I have intervals one up to k, two up to k plus one, three up to k plus two in the lowest row, and below I have zeros. Then when I go one step to the right and up, I take the last element and increase it by one. So here the K is removed from the integral interval and it becomes K plus one. And then it becomes K plus two, K plus three, et cetera, until I'm back to an interval. So that's how I go up. Then I can say how you go to the right is just add one to every element. Of the in of the k subset, or if you go down, you take this part, the large part, and move it one step, increase everything by one. So that's the definition of our lattice or grid. This is formed by special Blücher coordinates. The Blücher coordinates where the k subset is either one interval or two intervals, and one of them has just a singleton. But what we show is that um, every k by k determinant in here, in here is equal to one. So the SLK rule holds. And then so that, that's the hard part. But then once you have that, you can look at k plus one times k plus one determinants, um, use some like expansion by a column or a row and find that they're all vanishing. So it's tame. The cluster algebra is an integral domain. And so we have all the conditions for an SLK freeze. And that's that's our result. Um, except I should say we, we specialize these boundary elements to one. So here we set one. Otherwise, these determinants are going to be well, we first express the determinants in, per, in terms of the boundary coordinates. And when we specialize to one, we get the nice SLK result. Um, but we can use the theory of the cluster category behind if we pick a cluster or the cluster algebra and specialize all the plucus of that cluster to one. 
uh, we get an SLK freeze over the integers. So this is a combinatorial way to find SLK freezes. Well, this doesn't give all SLK freezes unless we have k equals two. So if we want to count when k is two, all the freezes arise that way because this sort of corresponds to the triangulations of the polygon. Um, when k is three and n is six, we can do this specializing a cluster to one and we get 50 freezes. And but there's another one which doesn't arise from specializing a, plug, a, a cluster to one. In fact, here we specialize a cluster to two. Well, that's not too bad, but then we go N equals seven, we get 800, 833 such freezes because there are 833 choices of specializing a, a cluster to one. And when n equals eight, it's 25,080. But for n equals seven, we already have 36 others, which we call non-unitary because we're not specializing a cluster to one. And in that case, that's all. And when a, n equals eight, we find 1,872 non-unitary ones, but we don't even know whether we found everything. So there are two questions here. First of all, are these all? And the other question is, how could we explain this algebraically, for example? Because the first part is like you specialize a cluster to one. You sort of you have a cluster tilting object which comes with algebraic characterizations like a rigid object. Um, so it has some interpretation in homological algebra, for example, but the others, we don't have any algebraic explication, explanation for the moment. We know um, that here we get it by partially setting a cluster to one, uh, to two, and then there's again, some part specialized to two, but there's also one cluster specialized, obtained by specialized to everything to three. So this counting only works in the finite cases. In all the other cases, there will be infinitely many phrases, but it will still be interesting in the other cases to understand the non-unitary parts. I mean, can we find nice clusters which we can specialize? to other entries than one. And just to finish this, so for three, six, I was drawing this lattice for the Plücke coordinates. So here we have the boundary of the frozen variables where we specialize the successive, like the full intervals to one. And then you see one, two, three becomes one, two, four, one, two, five, and one, two, six, which is again an interval because n equals six. And if I would continue, I would get one, two, one, and one, two, two. But really these are P one, two, one comes from E one, reg E two, reg E one. So these are all zero, which explains me the K minus one rows of zeros. Um, yeah, and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for the talk. Are there any questions? So I, I have a small one for this uh, correspondence between the SL2 freeze patterns and mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the polygon triangulations. Yeah. Are we only looking at periodic uh, patterns there or is every SL2 freeze pattern periodic? Yeah, we. I mean, if you take a tame freeze, it's always periodic. And I didn't say that, but in SL2, 
the tameness comes from the when you say nothing should be zero. So if all entries are positive integers, is automatic tame and then automatic periodic. Ah, okay. So we're looking at tame patterns and then actually going from convex polygons to the pattern will give you a tame pattern in that case because yeah. okay, interesting. But I mean, we also like have a model for non-periodic freezes. They will be infinite then. Okay. And then you cannot use a polygon, obviously. <laughs> but you can use um, just the integers and take a triangulation of the strip. Oh. So sort of take the integers. And we show that you can e reach each pattern by some triangulation of this strip. Yeah, I shouldn't. So it's kind of an infinite polygon. In yeah, case. yeah, or, or an infinite annulus. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other questions? That does not seem to be the case. So thank you again for the nice talk.